Welcome to episode 37 of Feeling Through Live. And today I'm joined by Marilee Talkington, who is an actress, an, an actor, an advocate, and also the founder of Access Acting Academy, which we will be talking about in great detail. But before we do that, uh, I'm gonna start with an image description. I'll begin. You'll see on the screen our title for today is episode 37, Academy for Blind and Low Vision Actors. Uh, I'm in the bottom left corner with my name, Doug Rowland, and feeling through next to it. And I'm a white male in my mid-30s with uh, my living room over my right shoulder and a picture over my left, uh, a little scruff on my face. Uh, there's an interpreter in the top right corner. Marilee is in the bottom right corner. And why don't you uh, give an image description yourself? Sure. Um, hey, everyone. I'm Marilee Talkington. Um, if... I had done this panel a week and a half ago, my image description would be different. <laughs> um, I used to have very, very, very long red curly hair, but today um, I have very short, straight red hair. Um, it's all gone, I cut it all off. Uh, I'm wearing red framed glasses. I have my little white AirPods in my ears, I think. My shirt is maroon. It's kind of a muscle shirt. And um, I have one of those Zoom backgrounds behind me that's like outer space. It's like, uh, I don't know what it, it's like this. It's, it's like um, a light rim around a planet. So I'm sort of glowing and floating in space. And I, I will say two things. One, your, your space-like background kind of matches the overall background of the screen, which is kind of like a bluish like like a little bit of a different tint of blue. And I was also wanted to save this for when we were live, but I really like your haircut. It's fantastic. Oh, thank you. I'm playing <laughs> around with it. I'm finding that I've got like eight new looks, which is really, really exciting. It's, it's I bought new... my first camera pomade. There you I go. See, it's a, it's a whole new world for you here. So. Yeah, totally. Well, you know. Oh, and I'm, I, I should say, um, I'm also very fair skinned and my age range for TV, cause I'm not gonna tell you my age, is from 35 to 52. That's my age range for television right now. Thanks. Fantastic. So, you know, there's, there is a lot that I want to talk with you about today. And what's, you know, actually I've been really, uh, we, we've been, we've been long in this, this episode has been long in the works here. We've been, uh, you know, we, we, we got an opportunity to meet each other via Zoom uh, about like mid last year. And I've been very excited to talk to you since then. Um, you know, certainly want to talk a lot about Access Acting Academy. Um, so I'd love if you could just, for starters, kind of just give just a very quick overview of what that is. And then I, I'd love to kind of talk about a, some other things that lead up to Access yep. Academy, but before, since it's just on the screen and underneath your name, I'd love for, if you could just kind of like let people know what it is. Sure. Access Acting Academy is a first of its kind actor training program for blind and low vision actors. Um, we, well, I, uh, I've been thinking about it for 20 years and basically started the building the infrastructure of it in um, 2019. And then at the beginning of 2020, we had our first five week full-time professional actor training intensive in Los Angeles with uh, 12 actors. And it was um, off the hook and it was all with master level teachers because that was extraordinarily important to me. It was all like MFA, um, graduate level teachers that are teaching at MFA programs in drama schools. Um, and uh, it's still, it's where I'm still going. Like I, that was budgeted. I had money for that. And now we moved virtual in the fall and we can get to that later. But now I'm trying to figure out what Access Acting Academy is going forward. Um, but it's a really amazing place with blind low vision actors in a space. And, I sh and what I'll say about this too is that the whole pedagogy is um, based on the premise that every single person is inherently rich with creative potential and you are not missing anything to become a potent creator. And we're not here to fix you either. We're here to actually invite you to realize your greatest self. 
So this isn't about fixing people. This isn't about um, trying to turn them into anybody else. This is about revealing the greatest part of who you are through acting. Well, I yeah. love that. Thank you. That was a great introduction. And, you know, I think we actually initially met each other because of a kinship on, you know, obviously what we're doing and feeling through with Robert being the first deaf blind actor and the way that we want to provide more opportunities for people who are deaf blind to participate in acting and, 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 you know, both sides of the camera and film and in the film and TV world. And obviously you're extremely passionate, um, not just as an actor yourself, but, pro but for providing more opportunities for other actors who are blind, low vision or with other disabilities to, to get more work. And, yeah. You know, I think one of the things that really struck me and stood out to me when we talked um, is your passion. Um, it's something that just like kind of oozes out of every pore and is really, really infectious in, in a good way. I know that's had a <laughs> negative connotation <laughs> lately. So right. let me walk that back a little bit. It's, right, right. <laughs> but you know what I mean? But, yeah. but, you know, I think, you know, obviously, you know, I think on the one hand, from what I know from you as a long time working actor yourself, um, you've, you've obviously had, I'm sure plenty of experiences that have really fueled your desire to create access acting Academy. And, and that has really fueled your, your passion and, and the necessity that you find to create opportunities for uh, actors with disabilities. Can you, can we kind of just walk back to like earlier on in your journey? Um, you know, I'd love to kind of wherever you want to start with that, but I'm just kind of curious if there's any key moments that pop out for you or experiences that you've had that really, if you will, you could say were maybe the seeds um, that sprouted into Access Academy. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a few. I think the very first one, and this is one that I go back to a lot, is when I went, it was my first cold read audition. And a cold read is when you show up to a theater or a studio or whatever, and they hand you this, this, they're called the sides, but it's basically the dialogue, the script that you're a part of the script that you're going to read. And it was too small for me to read. It's blurry, you know, and this was before anything was really digital. Um, and so I had to go find a photocopy machine to see if I could enlarge it. And we were out in really way out not the boondocks, but but really separate where the studio was. I, I had to take three buses to get there. And it took me two hours to find a photocopy machine. And it was really, I found like a real estate agency that let me go in and enlarge the script. It was a mess. It was still really hard to read, but I was determined to do this. And um, two hours later, I show back up at the theater. Or it wasn't even a theater, it was a studio. And I walk in and I've got this enlarged script and I'm still, I'm still needing to hold it close to my face. And I start reading, I start doing the audition and the director says to me, if you can't read the script, you don't belong on stage. And he excused me from the audition. So I didn't even get to audition. And it was that blatant, it was that clear, it was that blatant. And, and that was a really, huge moment because then I ended up taking the three buses home and I'm a brand new actor. I don't have the vocabulary. I don't, I didn't have the vocabulary. I didn't have the language to stand up for myself in that moment. I didn't even understand really what this meant, but I remember going home and it being really painful one and two, it was a moment where I had to ask myself, is he right? Um, and the answer came back very loudly, no, he's not right. But I didn't know how I was going to change anything, like if this is going to be the way it is. So that was a big moment. Um, now, did I know I was going to start an acting school from there? No, but that, was, that is a huge seed, huge. And then when I actually got into school, and the first movement class I ever took or I ever uh, signed up for, as soon as the teacher, I emailed the teacher and said, hey, at that time, I, I um, identified as visually impaired. I don't use that word anymore. I use legally blind. But at that time, I said, hey, I'm visually impaired. I'm going to be taking your class. She emailed back and she said, I can't teach you if you can't fully see me. And she unenrolled me from the class. Um, I mean, 
this is and this is after 1990 this is after the ABA came out so I mean all these are kind of like little things inside of me now what ended up happening and I'll try to condense this a little bit but I ended up realizing that I had to hide a little bit um, and so I ended up really only speaking up when I absolutely had to because I wanted to be in the class. So I fought to get into that class and I got in. And of course, of course, like I actually ended up with the highest grade in the class because I'm good at what I do. Like I'm actually supposed to be an actor, right? So um, then I got into grad school and that's really when I realized that something had to change. I got into grad school and I was studying acting and you know, when you're in class and I'm sure folks who, who are uh, watching, listening, experiencing this can resonate with this, deaf, deaf blind folks, deaf plus blind folks. Basically what they said is, you know, I say, hey, I can't really see what you're doing. And they say, well, just do the best you can. And that's something I would hear over and over and over again, do the best you can, which meant we're not gonna change what we're gonna do. So you just take whatever you can and figure it out. And, and the other actors were basically getting the full experience of the education. And I was having to do all this adaptation in my head. Um, and then faking it sometimes too, because they were using things like, don't talk to us about your vision. It's showing, um, uh, what was the language that they said? They said, oh yes. When you bring up your vision like that, it's like you're all about self-pity. Mm -hmm. So they would associate me advocating for myself as me pitying myself. Um, and yet, and so here's the irony of this is like, I figured stuff out all on my own. Like the scripts that I would get, they weren't accessible. I had to go home and type. I had a, I have a big CT, um, um, the big uh, CCTV. And I would put the, the script under there and I would type out, I would have to retype in my entire script for everything. I still do that actually. Um, so most actors would be doing their work and I'm there retyping everything. But all this to say is that I was working extraordinarily hard um, doing the work. I kind of shut my mouth because about my vision and what wasn't working because it was just, it was just a constant battle. And at the end of the grad program, like who is awarded the big award at the end of the year for excellence in the craft? Me, right? So it's like, it, I, I all, you know, it's what, what that is, is that I'm not saying, wow, great, Marilee, you're amazing. It's more like they're, um, these teachers and these programs and these conservatories and these studios have such deluded ideas about who we are and what we're capable of. And they also have these deluded ideas that acting is only good when it's taught one way. There, that's, that's a bunch of BS. It's our job as teachers to figure out our way in to each student. So those were the big seeds of, in terms of the training, in terms of like, knowing that there needs to be something more accessible, something more that says, yes, we want you into our class. This assign, this, this particular exercise isn't accessible. Let's figure it out on our feet. Let's do it. Um, and that's what I'm doing at Access Acting Academy. And then of course the whole, like, how many blind folks do you actually see on stage or TV? Uh, barely any at all. I mean, you see, sighted folks pretending to be blind, but that's, you know, that's, that's fake and that's just mimicry. But um, that teaches the conservatories and the studios and the universities that we're not actually worth teaching and that there's no jobs for us. So this is it's this really ugly cycle that's going on. And I feel like to get me to access acting Academy, I was like, I have to stop the cycle. I've got to stop the cycle somewhere. So we're at the beginning of it, but that's, those are kind of the juiciest little, I think, seeds. Well, thank you for sharing all that. And, you know, to, to comment on that cycle too, part of that cycle, as you were talking about too, is like how many 
people are there that were in a similar position to you that were told you don't belong here and listened to that and, and gave mm -hmm. up. And then yeah. you create this, this cycle too, because then you're, you're really, um, you're, you're really sh creating a much more shallow pool of, of potential actors who are blind or disabled. If, if they're, cause not everyone is going to have that same fortitude that you had. I mean, there's obviously plenty of others that do as well, but there's plenty of people who probably for good reason, didn't feel like kind of putting up with that and just was like, screw this. It's not worth it. And then you create such a smaller pool of, and, and are missing out on some really potentially great performers in this case, um, who just ultimately were like, I just don't have the, 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 the bandwidth or ability to deal with these obstacles right now. So I'm not going to pursue this. And yeah. you know, I, that's also what's so amazing about the work that you're doing is like, having this place where actors um, with disabilities can not only feel like they belong, but you work together to create a new methodology, right? That I'm mm -hmm. sure, as you're mentioning, is I'm sure ever evolving right now, but is something where it, it's really uh, that whole, two levels deeper of like, not just in, like welcoming in, but really embracing and, and reorienting how things have been traditionally done. What have mm -hmm. you found so far? Um, Cause you know, it's really interesting when we first connected, you were like, just like, you were like days away from launching this. And now as we're reconnecting, you've had a chance to really do a, a ton of the work. Mm -hmm. You know, what have you found from like when we first talked and you were just about to do this? versus what you've discovered as you've been doing the work. Yeah. So when we talked, I was just about to launch the virtual studio. I had already done the, the live one gotcha. in person and I learned a truck ton there, but I will say that what happened with the virtual studio and what I learned is exactly what you're talking about. Um, because I'm, uh, my mom's blind and I grew up in the blind community. And as soon as I started acting, I had so like the very first television show I did, I had so many blind folks come up to me and say, I wanted to pursue acting, but told I was, you know, but was told I couldn't. And so they didn't pursue it. That's what I heard when I went virtual, honest, honest to God, I thought people would be swarming. What happened. And I just have to hold my heart here because it, I got on so many Q and A's and support groups and panels. And I was there convincing them that they had value and that they could come and take an acting class. And the belief system that the world has basically been puncturing them with for so long became theirs. And so I was having discussion after discussion with people saying, yes, you can come. You actually have some artistry in you. And theirs was like, well, how are we going to do it? I don't know how there's no career for me. There's no this. And I'm like, let's take a breath and let's, let's drill down to what, what are you actually believing about yourself that you've taken on? That's not actually your beliefs. So that was the first thing that happened. And that was a real shock. Um, because they were, I was talking to so many people with that. Um, and then we started having the virtual classes and the people that actually showed up, most of them had never taken an acting class in their entire life. So it wasn't just like actors showing up. And this is the part that's so exciting to me. It was people that had never, it was like a dream. And this was their first experience of acting. And that just feels so amazing. It feels so amazing to be able to offer that space and also to know that the teachers that I'm teaching, a master teacher, Jeff Crockett, our other master teacher, Sammy Grant, like they're the top caliber teachers. So they're not just showing up to a place of belonging, they're showing up and getting great training. Um, so I feel like, and, and in terms of like, you know, the actual classes, yes, I'm going to change the classes around come spring. I learned a lot about virtual teaching, um, you know, two week class versus four week class versus eight week class. But the thing that is so amazing too on zoom that I've learned that I learned in the room, but learned on zoom too, is that we're listening to each other. So most of the folks didn't, none of the folks were deaf. 
um, th this particular group that I worked with, they were all blind, low vision. For them to be in a group where most of the video was off and we were listening and they had always been told that they were missing something that was going on. So they didn't actually have the right things to perceive the action. And then all of a sudden they're listening to what's going on and they're going, they're actually, their sophistication as audience members just skyrocketed. And that um, is thrilling to experience and be part of. It's thrilling. Um, yeah, I mean, I could just keep talking about it because it's such an exciting thing to be involved in. It's, it's really interesting to hear about, you know, new and different ways to teach an acting class that, you know, anyone who, you know, that people haven't necessarily thought about before. And I love how you're describing it as, you know, people have been so conditioned in this case, you know, blind and low vision actors specifically have been so conditioned to think they like can't do it the right way or are missing something and to completely flip that on its head and find this new way and just this different, rich, beautiful way to, uh, teach and, and learn and experience the world of acting really kind of just, it takes my imagination to a bunch of new places that I haven't considered before. Another thing that really resonated about what you're just talking about, it's some, it's so similar to Robert Tarango, who's the deafblind actor and feeling through, um, you know, he's, he was in his fifties when we shot feeling through and, um, you know, he had mentioned that, uh, I, I actually didn't learn this until well into the process of working with him, but you know, he told me, you know, I think it was even after we shot the film that he meant, he finally mentioned me that he'd always wanted to be an actor. He just like, just uh, as someone who was born deaf and then later became blind, he just didn't think there was any way that that could happen. Like in what, in every reference point that he had in the world, there was just no way that was going to happen. So he just did, it was like the type of thing that you dream about you know, when you're like dozing off to sleep at night and it's that kind of like, just like we're, you know, we, we were joking about being on Zoran or whatever world we were <laughs> right, talking right. about, like this thing that's kind of like, well, wouldn't that be great? But yeah, sure. Um, and then all of a sudden he finds himself, um, you know, someone who's at this, at the center of a film that a lot of tons of people have gotten to watch and, and love and praise his work for. And now he is very motivated to continue being an, being an actor and pursue other opportunities and advocating for more people to consider hiring, uh, writing roles for actors w who are deaf blind. So it's just, it's, it, it, you know, it's, we create the world that we live in as much as we, um, if we don't think about it, we inherit, we inherit um, mm -hmm. a, a world that like is closed off to certain things that is not innately so, but it's just something that if we don't really examine that, it's easy to kind of just continue with the status quo and go, oh no, you can't do that. Um, yeah. When of course you, you very much can and you're proving that on a regular basis. I'm interested in, I think this is really, um, I'm, I'm interested in what you're saying because I'm also, there's like, write the roles for us and there's, we should be, considered for any role out there considered. And then I think that the space that one of the spaces that we need to move into, and you're clearly moving into this, or you are in it is people are going to say, and they say this to me all the time is great. We want to hire this person for the bartender. How the hell do we work with them? Like then there's all those questions. And I feel like that's what you're doing right now is you're developing the actual techniques and the prot protocol for lack of a better word um, of how to actually work with deaf blind actors. Like for me, you asked me how to work with a, a blind low vision actor. I'm like, here you go. Like I've got it all worked out now. And now I just sort of hand it over and go, let's talk about it. You got that question. Great. I got an answer, but that wasn't available before. So I feel like that's also the place we want to head is like, consider us for everything, hire us and then ask the question about how, or, or actually, let me take that back. Maybe the house should be early on, but it shouldn't prevent us from being um, considered for anything. Does that make sense? That makes complete sense. And you yeah. know, I think 
there, there's, there's an evolution that I think is started and is happening and it, it, there's different steps along the way, right? So when you, as you described so, so beautifully through your own experience, you kind of really spoke into the weight of so many years of not considering certain groups of people and not acqui- and like not willing to change how things have been done to, to create a, uh, an environment that that's accessible, um, and, and user friendly for different groups of people. Um, so very, like the first step it, it feels like, and I'm sure you, you get this a lot in you know, your work as an actor as well is like just starting to create an awareness that leads to a willingness for people who haven't previously considered these things to be like, Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Tell me more. Right. So that's like a huge first step, right? Like just mm-hmm, to have mm-hmm. someone who is in any position of gatekeeper, quote unquote, to, to be willing to hear more. That's actually like in realistically, not saying that that's the bar that we want, but realistically speaking for a lot of people out there, that's a big step. That's I think happening more and more right now. And then from there, you know, people who are helping, if you will, pioneer some of these things like you're doing with your, with access acting Academy, it's like, a little bit of the weight is on the shoulders of people like you to go like, Hey, look, I've really figured this out. Let me walk you through it. Right. And then start to like really fine tune and expand the, 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 the wisdoms that you're gaining in doing the work that you do so that it, at some point it's more widely known. There's more people who are aware how to execute those things. And then it just becomes very much like, you know, a conversation that, a Q and A I was doing with Marley Matlin yesterday. She was talking about very and and um, her longtime producing partner, interpreter Jack Jason. We're both talking about how you've already got so many people on a film set per se. There's so much cr- crew involved, so many different departments. Like, why isn't this just a department, a part of how a, cr- a film set works? In in just speaking mm-hmm. of film specifically, mm-hmm. but obviously mm-hmm. there's different mm-hmm. mediums here. Why isn't this just at some point like? You got the grip team over here, right? And you got yeah. like, you know, you you got like the guy who's like operating the truck over here, and you, like you've got like actors, and you've got you know everything. Then you've got an interpreting team, or you've got whatever accessibility team, or whatever the you know terminology will be once this kind of is more widely adopted. Just as it's part of a film set, right? So it's yeah. like yeah. that's kind of like I think where we're where we're moving to. <laughs> um, yes. and, and, and I think, you know, the work that you're doing is really creating at the very least, you know, I, I, and this is what I really resonated with me about the work you're doing when we first connected is you're creating far less excuses for people who are in the position of hire actors to have, right? Well, it's like, well, we'd love yeah. to hire a blind or low vision actor, but we, you know what? There's just, there's not as many with the chops that we need to fill this role. And it's like, actually you're wrong because there's now a a whole crop of actors who are blind and low vision being trained by top notch teachers who are helping them find their voice and their, their creativity and their talent. So it's like, that's a big thing too, is sometimes you need to force the hand a little bit, you know, and, and kind of like, already have an answer for some of the excuses that might come up. And it's something that, you know, we'd love to be able to do, um, you know, for the deaf blind community of having, doing so. And, you know, we've obviously talked maybe about working together on this at some point, Yeah. Um, yeah. but to to also have there be less excuses, right. About, um, well, there just isn't the deaf blind talent out there to be able to, to do this role or to be able to consider in these roles. And, and that's also, it's kind of like this multi-pronged, uh, thing and you know that's why uh, hopefully there's a lot more people that will will not only be inspired to be actors from the work that you're doing but also be inspired to take on leadership positions of helping further opportunities for other performers um, with disabilities. On that note, yeah. I'm going to take a quick pause for an interpreter switch. Great. So stand by on that. And we are all set continuing here. So yeah, you know, I mean, that's, that's why we can really like, there's so many layers of importance to, to that work. And, and, um, yeah, and I'm sure, you know, it's something that you've probably already seen pay, pay, pay dividends. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, there was a lot you just <laughs> said, which is all fa fantastic. But I actually took a note here, which was one of the things that I love, and I would love to be able to like, you know, collab with Marley and her people about an accessibility department as part of any film and TV set. I think that's the way to go because I feel like what's happening is people are being hired as consultants rather than let's just get an apart a department in there because it makes me think too that there's so many folks that don't disclose either. And if we normalize that there's an accessibility department and that that's just part of, that's just part of the game, that's just part of the business then I feel like more folks would probably feel more comfortable to actually disclose their disabilities, whatever they are, and be supported. Be fully supported so they can do their best work that they can do on set or on stage. So I just love this idea of an accessibility department and not just a consultant. Yes. Um, the other thing that kind of popped up is like, <sighs> hmm. I advocate a lot. And the people that I roll with advocate a lot, like so much so that it can be overwhelming and it can kind of take over your life. And in fact, the past two years have mostly been me advocating for the community. And there was some point, and I'm saying this for a reason, because I knew that as soon as I got any remote status at all, I'm not a celebrity. But as soon as I got any status at all, I was gonna use it. I was gonna use it to try to help the people coming from coming behind me. I was gonna try to kick the doors open so more people could come behind me. And I did that for the past probably two and a half years solid. And my artist is atrophying. And so she is really crying for attention and, and and I'm, I know this is a little bit of a pivot, but I wanna bring this up too, because I often forget that my art is also my advocacy, is that those of us with disabilities who are actually out there creating art are as impactful making change for disabled folks and for the industry as me going and creating a class. Like, because that's changing belief systems on a larger scale. Um, and I'm part of the community that I'm serving. So I have to make space for me as an artist as well. So I know that's a little bit of a pivot, but I wanted to throw that in there because I know the people that I roll with, I mean, it's so much advocacy and it's like, we're making steps, but there's so much more to do. It can be like any, I, I know for myself that I can often feel guilty if I'm not doing this a thousand percent of the time and I'm not doing my art. Like if I do my art, it's like, no, 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 you have to get back to advocacy. And I have to remember, Marilyn, you have to keep cultivating yourself as an artist. That's who you are. And that's actually what's going to serve not only you, but the larger community. Um, tangent. Anyway, so that's throwing no, that out there. It's an amazing tangent, um, not tangent, totally related. And you know, that makes me, that brings me to, let's talk about the actor part of yourself, which is a huge part of yourself. You know, um, I know you have a, a long career in, on stage and in film and TV. You know, something that was certainly a, a notable um, notch on your belt of recent years is your role in the Apple TV series C, which is uh, you, a, a, um, a, a show that's uh, de very fitting to this conversation. Can you talk a little bit about um, what that show is about and, and your participation in it? Because I know it runs deeper than just being an actor, that, that it led to other opportunities I think with Apple and and also from that but can you tell tell us a little bit about that show and your involvement in it yeah so C is a show that is a futuristic show um, where the human race actually contracted a virus um, a pandemic and went blind um, so everybody in the show is blind um, and because they all went blind they the human race, in the show, I'm not saying I believe this, but the human race basically devolved. Um, so, and, and there's all these clans that are roaming the United States. Um, there's warriors 
there's mystics. This is also like hundreds of years in the future too. Um, and being part of that show is very complicated for me. Um, it was the biggest acting opportunity I have had and I got to work with some amazing artists and I was on set with hundreds of people mimicking blindness because most of the actors on the set were sighted and most of the artists, uh, all the artists were sighted. And that, even talking about it, it, um, it hurts to talk about. So it's very complicated because would I say those people are bad people? No. Are they misinformed? Yes. Uh, um, are they living out the delusion that, that the ableist delusion that we're not worthy to play ourselves? Like I was one of, I had the largest recurring role uh, in the, uh, for a blind actor um, in the first season. And I don't know what's gonna happen with the second season. But what ended up happening, getting to your point about Access Acting Academy is that while I was acting there, I not just saw an opportunity, but um, a deep need for someone to speak up. Um, they had a consultant, but the consultant, super cool guy, but he doesn't have the 25 years of experience that I do. Um, and so I took the opportunity to talk to the people in charge, even though I was nobody, like who the hell am I? I'm working with Jason Momoa, for God's sakes. I'm working with Alfred Woodard. I'm working with like international celebrities. And I'm like, hi, we've got a problem over here, you know, like, but it just was one of those things where I basically said to myself, if I don't say anything, I have to leave. I can't stay here and not say anything. And, um, what that led to was a lot of really amazing conversations, um, illuminating conversations, hard conversations with the people involved, and me saying, you need to cast more blind actors. You need to cast more blind actors, and them saying, where are they? And me saying, you're gonna give me money and I'm gonna do this program. And they're like, okay. And so that started basically the road of Access Acting Academy. And even though I'd been thinking about it for 20 years, it was this thing with Apple, who was in charge of the show, was very eager actually to do better, to do more. Um, and their head of accessibility is, she's fire. She's really fire. And she was like, what do we need to do? What do we need to do to make this right? And so basically I pitched Apple and the heads of development of, um, or the heads of the Apple TV studio and basically got this, the pilot program um, lit, uh, which was kind of, you know, it's the first, it's the, what I've been told is this is the first of its kind that Apple's ever funded. Apple's never funded any sort of educational program like this before. So um, kudos to Apple in a big way. And then I just cranked. I mean, I cranked like full time was not gonna even remotely explain how many hours I worked, you know, putting this together and preparing and doing it. And then also I was teaching it and I was teaching it and running it at the same time. And also basically being the only blind person that was on staff. So I was teaching the teachers and teaching the students. Um, and it was uh, quite, something. And I think that at the end of it, because we had a, a performance at the very end, a private performance for about 90 people and um, mostly industry, um, hire the mucky mucks in Hollywood, um, casting directors, writers, showrunners, people from Apple. And this is where the power is. They thought I'm assuming that they thought that they were coming in to watch some blind actors act. And what they ended up coming in to see was an amazing night of performance. That night, at the, at the end of our five weeks, when all these industry folks were in the audience and these actors 
who are blind and low vision were doing exceptional work, both acting and movement work, they, I think literally it's short circuited their brains and it's the first time ever in my 25 years of theater ever that during the talk back, every single person stayed for an hour. And then after the talk back ended, they all came on stage and kept talking to people. And I feel like those are the moments that we need because people need to experience, we can talk to them all day long. We can tell them you need to do this and you need to do this and these are all the reasons why, but they need to viscerally experience what we're talking about. Like your film, people are gonna see it, hear it, experience it, and they're gonna go, oh my God, I didn't know. And so with Access Acting Academy, people came, it was a smaller audience, but people were like, oh, I, I didn't, I, oh, oh. And this was only after five weeks of training? Oh, I just didn't know. So I feel like that's, that's kind of the longer story of the Apple, the Apple to Access, the C to Apple to Access Acting Academy, but they really, um, you know, Apple's all about accessibility. So I'm hoping that we will be able to fund another intensive five week full-time intensive going forward. Crossing fingers, people, crossing both my fingers. You know, as you were talking, I couldn't help but think about uh, the, the Marilee who was at the start of her acting career uh, that had just faced that um, director, casting director, I forgot which one you said that said, oh, mm -hmm. if you can't read the script, you don't belong here. And that, that pivotal moment where you're at home thinking, really considering if you do and, you know, giving her a, a huge, uh, you know, a huge um, thank you to deciding that she did. Because I think it was just to trace back to that moment, you know, as far as, you know, what it's led to um, and, and, the, and the, the huge ripple effects of that over time are um, nothing short of, of incredible and massive and really end up impacting a lot of other people's lives in a really significant way. Um, so just when you were telling that story of kind of where it's taken you, you know, to these really important rooms in, in front of very influential people who make very influential decisions on how a lot of the, of what we see on, on TV and in films and how that really informs individuals and, creates an understanding of the world around us that it really does have a start to have a global impact in that way. When you think about how many people, you know, just Apple TV alone, how many people take in their shows and you start to multiply that times how many people are inspired to do things differently, or at least think about diff things differently moving forward. Um, mm -hmm. Can mm -hmm. you tell us a little mm -hmm. bit too about, I know you, you were honored with an award from the National Federation for the Blind that also I think has helped fuel the work you're doing now. Can you can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and I'm gonna back up just a little bit oh, because yeah, Apple, funded, uh, Apple funded the five week program and then I had no funding. Um, and I had been doing so much volunteer work myself, but what happened in, I think it was March or April, the NFB National Federation of the Blind. Sorry, yeah. Um, no, no, it's like I will say four, and they're like, we're of, we're of, and I'm like, yeah. Um, they, they're the world's largest blind organization, for those that don't know. And they have an award called the Dr. Jacob Balotin Award, and he was the first blind physician. He was a surgeon. And talk about breaking barriers. Holy, talk about believing in yourself. And this was in the late 1800s. So, like, he killed it. Um, it's awarded to an individual and an organization that the NFB believes is um, basically breaking down negative belief systems about blind folks and pushing pushing the, the right narrative forward for blind people in the world. Um, and the other, the organization that got it is Oh, I forgot the name of the actual university, but they're making astrophysics accessible, which is amazing. So they're like, they've got this big, they're, they're working with like telescopes and the maps and they're making maps of the stars accessible. 
And um, that's how you made it to outer space today, actually. Yes, part they helped me. <laughs> uh, and I was, I honestly, when they called me and said, we want to honor you as the individual for 2020, the Jacob Lawton Award, I, it still, it still chokes me up a bit because I think, who the hell am I? You know, like there's people that are doing so much more, but um, in my niche in the arts and acting, um, I'm, I am trailblazing in this area. Um, so that part of that award was a cash element and it was an individual award. It didn't actually go to Access Acting Academy, it went to me. But when they told me how much the award was, which I didn't know until they actually, you know, the award ceremony, and they told me it was $25,000, I just went, I, I, I was overwhelmed. I'd never, like that just seemed like, I couldn't believe that I got that money. Um, but I knew that when they, when that award, when I received that award, I was like, okay, it's time to go virtual. I've got some seed money here that I can put into creating the virtual academy. Now, 25 grand is not gonna last. And that's, you know, I'm using it. And it's, and, and, and here's the thing about this that, I, that needs to change is that I still haven't paid myself. I pay everybody else that's involved. Um, but I'm saying this publicly right now is that's not sustainable for me, not to pay myself. Um, and because I'm a working person too that needs to eat and survive. But right now, at the moment, there's not a huge budget to do that. So that's actually how it happened. Um, that's, that's how the Virtual Academy came about. So now I'm like, okay, where's the next round of funding going to come so that this can be a sustainable thing? So, you know, you're, you're, you're obviously talking about some of what's very clearly needed moving forward. Um, are there other thoughts now that you've gotten to do both the in-person and the virtual classes, um, how you're envisioning um, the next steps and kind of where you want to go with this, whether anywhere from like short term to long term? Yeah, I mean, I, this is definitely something that's going to stay. Like, it's going to keep going. It's what I'd like to see is a studio program. I want to I want to keep doing intensives because they are powerful major transformation can happen when you are in a room full time with folks. It's, it's stunning. I've done it myself, you know, 20 years ago and I know what that's like. Um, so definitely those, if we can get the funding for it in terms of the virtual, I, I want to keep going with a virtual Academy because I'm reaching people that are in some country town in Alabama that don't have any access to anything. And they're showing up to the, the movement class, like, or the voice class. That is so exciting. The reach of virtual acting classes through Access Acting Academy is, is like, it's huge now. So, so I definitely want to keep going with that. And, and in fact, I'm imagining right now, and I'm going to be having a, a visioning meeting with my co-collaborators very soon about how we can sustainably do this. Do we want to create like core classes? Acting, voice, embodiment, movement, and then have some musical theater and voiceover. Is that what it's going to be? Um, I don't think at this point I'm going to turn it into an MFA program. I don't think that's what this is. Um, but I definitely want to, I would love to get to a point where it's like a one or two year certificate program that actors could go through. And at the end of it, really feel prepared to be out in the world, to be out, uh, you know, to feel that they have the skill set and the strategies and that they, they have a craft, they actually have a craft now, not just a desire and not just some talent, but they have craft and they know to, they know how to cultivate their own art. Um, so I feel like that's the way I'm, I'm headed. Um, at the same time, I need my acting and my directing to go too. So, so I'm kind of playing this one out. You yeah, understand this. Uh, a... uh, absolutely. And I was just going to follow up with specifically through the act, actor lens and or director lens like are there um are there are there particular you know things on the horizon or things that like you're really interested in pursuing in that space or, or wanting specific 
opportunities in moving forward? Anything that's like kind of coming up for you on that side of the coin? Yeah. I mean, there's things that there's nothing that's, you know, there's no bird in the hand right now, but there's things that I feel not only that I'm ready for, but that I just want, I want to be on a series, um, a really juicy raw series, um, as a series regular. And the reason I'm saying series regular is because one, I want to be able to carry that story arc. I want to be with the character for a long period of time. And I want the financial stability that series regulars, that being a series regular offers. Because I can get a guest star here and there once in a while, but that is not, it's still not financially, um, it, it doesn't offer me financial stability. So, I, and there's so many actors I'm excited about doing, uh, working, working with, not doing, you know what I mean. Sure. Um, but, the, but the other thing is, is that I've been working on a pilot and um, I'm really excited about continuing to, to craft this pilot and eventually getting that scene. I, I, I wrote for stage um, for quite a few years and writing for television has been writing a pilot has been really exciting and fun. And so I would love to be able to see that go. Whether or not I'm acting in it, I'm not sure, but, but the cast actually has blind and disabled folks all through it, but it's not about disability. It's actually about something completely different. It just so happens to have disabled folks in it. So those are the two big things, actually. I'm ready for my series and I'm ready to sell my series. Mm -hmm. That's right? great. Well, those are those yeah. are definitely uh, really good goals to have for this this upcoming year and and beyond. Um, yeah. Have you have you found? I'm just wondering in your personal experience, like, you know, there's been a lot of talk. Um, I think ve you know very recently, I'd say even in the last like year or so, with a little bit more of a. Um, attention given in Hollywood and kind of more mainstream outlets to um, actors with disabilities or, or creators with disabilities. Do you feel like in your personal experience, aside from the work, that, the advocacy work you're, you're personally doing, just to kind of what you gather being in the industry that, does it feel like there is like, has been real discernible change? Does it feel like it's more just like conversation right now and we're still like kind of waiting for the change. Like what's your like finger to the pulse on that, knowing that it's something that's like at least c coming up more in, in mainstream conversations. Yeah. I think, I think it's a little bit of everything. I think it's coming up more. It's not coming up in every room. Um, there's definitely more opportunities now than there ever has been in my career, meaning for, for other folks like I'm, um, for example, I had five different casting directors reach out to me a month ago in 10 days looking for blind actors. In 10 days, five different casting directors were like, do you have a blind kid age 12? Do you have um, a blind adult, a blind guy age 60? Do you have this, do you have that? And so I was actually referring the students, some of them getting their very first auditions. But anyway, yes, I think it's, it's starting to crackle but it's, we're still at that beginning bumpy spot where people still aren't fully convinced. They're like, yeah, we should be talking about this. Let's, let's look for this actor and this actor. And then half to 75% of the time they cast a non-disabled actor. And they said, well, we did our due diligence. So I think it's a little lumpy, but we're definitely moving forward. It's not skyrocketing, but we're definitely moving forward and conversations are happening. And I think it's because folks like anybody that has status, um, Lauren Ridloff, um, oh, who's that? Just fine. Nylee DeMarco. Oh, he's, um, he's so beautiful. Um, you know, anybody that has some sort of status and they use that status and platform to speak up, it helps everybody. So, I think the more folks that actually are getting into those positions that are speaking about it, um, they're, they're helping make big changes. Ali Stroker, Ali Stroker winning the Tony changed so many people's minds. We've seen a lot happen since she won the Tony. In fact, when I actually went to pitch 
<clears throat> pitch my budget to the heads of um, Apple TV. They're like, can we just, can I just start, one of the guys was like, can I just start by saying I just saw Ali Stroka win the Tony and I didn't know it was possible. And now I know. It took her, it just took one moment. And all of a sudden he's like, oh, oh, I, okay, we're here to listen. Um, yeah, I don't know. What do you, well, I mean, you're like, how long have you been with feeling through? And have you seen a shift in the time yeah, that you've been with the project? That's a good question. You know, uh, I started really actively started the journey of feeling through three years ago. Um, and I'll be honest, like I'm a lot of the work that I, though I've connected with a lot of amazing people through the work, I've been, I think a little bit more insulated. Um, so it's harder for me to have a finger to the pulse because a lot of it's kind of happened within like the, the art, the feeling through like community and then mm -hmm. connect, just like connecting with different people out of it. So it's, it's harder. It's a little bit harder for me to gauge, uh, cause of being in a little bit of a bubble, but I mean, I've just noted that like, you know, we, as we were talking about before we went live today, like we're feeling through as a part of slam dance this year. We're really excited to be a part of slam dance and you know, slam dance this year has just added, um, a new category called unstoppable which is for um, featuring films that are either have actors with disabilities or, or made by creators with disabilities. And they're really excited about it. You know, they've been in a lot of their public facing materials. They've really been leading with that and have been really earnestly working with everyone in that um, block to really try to make it the best it can be and really learn a lot mm -hmm. throughout the process. Um, um, feeling through and Helen Keller services are working with them to provide accessibility for their panels and they've been really receptive to trying to make the panels as accessible as possible. So those are my reference points, you know, um, more as far as like seeing that there's definitely, um, not just a change in certain spaces, but also like this enthusiasm that's starting to happen. Um, and again, I think it's like choice, choice entities and individuals at this point, but, but, but like the enthusiasm I think is, is the cool thing to note, at least in a couple of the specific um, reference points that we've had with feeling through. You know, it makes me think, and I wonder what you think about this, um, is that films can have huge impact. I just wonder, like, I, I don't know the answer to this, film versus TV, what has more impact in terms of creating change? Because you have Crip Camp, the documentary Crip Camp, which was a sensation like complete sensation. You have uh, Peanut Butter Falcon. Um, oh, I, can't, uh, I can see his face, but I can't remember his name. You have that kid who's this amazing actor who's Down Syndrome. All of a sudden people are like, oh, um, you've got your film. And I just, I'm curious about the impact of film versus TV. Like, because I feel like I, I definitely want to get into film too, like in a big way, but the people that are making films, some are crossing over to TV, but that seems to be a different, a slightly different crowd than those folks that are doing episodics um, on TV. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I think so. But I think also just, you know, with the way that the way in which we consume content has been changing content in a way that there's starting mm -hmm. to be a little bit more fluidity. You know, I think even if you just think about there with streaming services, um, whereas formerly there were like certain lengths of whether they be films or TV episodes that kind of couldn't really fit into one slot or in another. Now anything is fair game, like any mm -hmm. length, because we're, we, you know, we're not like scheduling blocks on TV. Um, they're just these streaming episodes where you can click and watch anything. Um, so I think there's a little bit, maybe more, more fluidity between those worlds. Um, but yeah, as far as influence, I mean, I think they can both have huge impact, you know? I mean, I think there, there's certain things of ways in which a film gets out into the world that has a certain impact, but also being able to like live with a TV show, right? Over the evolution of, you know, a number of different episodes and potentially seasons is a whole nother thing. Um, mm -hmm. So they, yeah, I think they can both have just as big of an impact in, in different ways. But, you know, I'd mm -hmm. love as we kind of wrap up here for today and we, we have plenty more to talk about. So we'll have to do this again at some point, mm -hmm. but, um, two things I want to note. One is I want to go to, um, Julie who wrote a comment. She said, 
I've been wanting to act since I was a teenager. I just don't know where to start. I tried an, an actor class online, but there was no access for a deaf person like me. Do you have mm-hmm. anything that comes to your mind as far as like any a, anything that you've come across that would be a good reference point or personally maybe with how you're evolving Access Acting Academy? Yes, so I've got three things. One, uh, there's Deaf West, and I believe that they actually offer acting classes. Deaf West. Um, I would look there first, because they if, if they're doing that already, there's no, like, they've figured out the learning curve. Two is there is, I don't want to say it's less professional, but it's definitely for beginners, like, to, to get a taste of acting. There's a program at Queens Theater in New York called Theater for All, TFA, Theater for All at Queens Theater. And once a year, they do like a two to three week um, offering of free classes to actors across disability and deafness. And they make stuff accessible. They're like, it's accessible for blind, it's accessible for deaf. Um, and it's kind of a, you know, a class here, a class there, you'll get like, a taste of stuff. My um, vision for Access Acting Academy is that we absolutely will be opening classes up to deaf and hard of hearing folks. Absolutely. Um, And this is something that I'm thinking about right now that I'm that I'm imagining and that I'm visioning. um, Because I I want it open to anybody that wants to come because I want to offer this amazing training to anyone that wants it, that's never had the opportunity. So we're not, I'm not there yet, but Access Acting Academy, it, so this is what I'll say, sign up for the, the email list because guaranteed you're gonna hear something this year. Guaranteed yeah. that there will, be, especially now that Zoom has closed captioning built in. I don't know if it's good or not, but I know that they've, they've, just, um, they've just released that. So. I am absolutely working towards this. Well, Julie says thank you. And for, for anyone else who's interested in Access Academy, Acting Academy, can you tell them the best place to find out more information? Yeah, www.accessacessacting.com. Accessacting.com. Perfect. Yep. There it is. Well, Marilee was so, I mean, the, the wait was worth it. It was so great to talk to you today. <laughs> Um, I'm sure we'll have uh, plenty of other things to discuss in the near future, both offline and hopefully online again. And uh, yeah, just really just, you know, uh, such a huge fan of everything that you're doing. And um, it certainly motivates me in the work that I'm doing. Um, and I just, I really appreciate talking to you. I thank you so much, Doug. I, I love what you're doing. And I'm so grateful that you asked me to be in this conversation. Thank you. Well, thank you and thank you to everyone who tuned in today. Um, We will be back again next week. I think we might actually have to be at a slightly different time, but I will be posting about that ahead of time. And uh, hope you have a wonderful weekend and see you next week. Bye. Thank you, interpreters. Thank you.